Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for March 30th, 2021. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is our weekly webcast and podcast where we talk about every organizing topic you can imagine. And we get those uh, sources of inspiration about what we're going to talk about from you when you go and post on our social media channels. So we appreciate that you do that. And we absolutely read them and use them every week. If you're joining us in the Zoom meeting for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to let me know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We are streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can also share your questions and suggestions there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast each week, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833, use meeting ID 993-419-863 and password clutter to join the meeting. Uh, Sammy has joined the meeting. That's Sammy in the background. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> We're going to start this week by following up on last week's weekly tittle. The assignment was called Slice Through the Knot. We invite you to identify a large or very complex decluttering project on your to-do list, then to examine it from a few fresh angles in search of a new, bold, or creative solution. We would love to hear reports on this assignment from the peanut gallery, <laughs> but while we, while we wait for comments to come in on that, um, YouTube viewer Suzanne reports, my Gordian knot is separating and organizing my longtime chalked up sewing area of my different craft supplies and other odd bits without spreading into our sitting area and making a quick impact to host my daughter's baby shower at the end of May. So Suzanne is doing a great job of using the anticipation of her daughter's baby shower as a source of motivation to get going. And the phrase without spreading into our sitting area is an important key one of the ways that useful and fun stuff turns into clutter is when it ex escapes its boundaries and starts crowding out other parts of our lives. So um, clearly the goal here for this craft room is to contain it all in one room, which means that you have to filter to actually fit into that one room. And so um, it sounds like she's working on slicing and dicing that big project into some smaller pieces. I think that, um, one way that you can tackle it if you need some help is because you say there's a sewing area and different craft supplies and odd bits. And so maybe you can choose to pick one of the crafts that's happening in that room and focus on the supplies that are related to that one craft instead of trying to do all the room at once. Go through and pluck out something that isn't sewing or, um, and, um, you know, here's beading or paper crafts or something else you got going on there. Pick one craft and go pull all the supplies that are related to it, sort them all out, decide that uh, if there's any of them that can go, and then containerize that one uh, craft into a couple of buckets, into a storage unit, into some kind of a drawer unit, whatever works for you to fit into that room. Um, I would also evaluate the craft's volume based on how interested in the craft that you are. So if it's not a craft that you're super excited about or that you do all the time or like crazy, then I wouldn't keep a hundred pieces of something that you only do once every two years. Just filter the crafts through how often and how interested you are in that particular craft. So you surrender more of the room to the crafts that you do all the time and you surrender less of the room to the crafts that you don't do so often. There, that's my uh, my uh, slicing through your knot. That's one way to slice through your knot. <laughs> Bonnie said, to solve the knot of last week's tittle, I realized I just had to do it. And after a bit of preparation, I started and almost finished. Connie, would you share with us, would you want to share with us what you, what exactly you did? You don't have to, just if you want to raise your hand and we'll, we'll pipe you in. And Deborah said, I sorted through a pile of papers and tossed everything except the most recent. Yay, good Linda, job. Linda cleaned out 
all the clothes in her closet and drawers that don't fit or look good on her. Yay, that was a big chore, I bet. And Jane said, my 90-year-old dad and I sorted, gathered, copied, and organized estate papers and put them in a new safe deposit box at a bank closer to where we live. Ooh, that's a biggie. And that's a good one, too. Like, I bet that felt really important to him to make sure that all that paperwork was ready. I'm sure that was a big emotional uh, relief for him to manage that. That's awesome. Good job. And... Connie said I had to repot lots of plants, clean and tidy the balcony for the warm season. That's Ooh. that's actually she's a week ahead on next week's tittle. I right? mean, this week's tittle. She has <laughs> jumped, she has jumped the gun. She anticipated she, us. She's jumped the tittle line. <laughs> she has. <laughs> that's so funny. Diane says I donated hangers needed for an organization in town. Kept finding more. Ha ha. Aha. And JC said, I clean my kitchen from top to bottom, cabinets, fridge, freezer, even behind and underneath, dishwasher, even walls. Ooh, that was Fantastic. a big job. Yeah, good job. And then Barbara added, I finally wiped my old desktop computer and gave it away and then found some floppy disks. Gone. Oh, that's a big one. When you plus, get rid of the old tech, woo. Plus an old backup monitor that I hadn't needed for nine years. <laughs> right? Yay. Process and recycling tech. We love it. Okay. So we have That's another we have another follow-up item we wanted to cover today. Mm. A YouTube comment on my report about reconciling receipts with dad. Viewer Tim wrote, Ed's story reminded me of how my oldest daughter Many times we'll use her credit or debit card when she's at a store to buy things that I need too. She'll get a separate receipt for mine because keeping her stuff and my stuff separate helps a lot when we later have to figure out how much money I owe her. We've gotten really good. She lives with us, which makes it easier at taking the receipts when they first come home and write them down on a list we keep. That way we keep a running total of how much I owe her. It helps a lot to write it down automatically every single time. I feel like um, I feel a little judged. I feel just a little judged. No, he, Tim didn't say that. That was me. Once the amount gets to a total that seems large enough to transfer over to her, then I just do that. So <laughs> that's funny. So his approach to tracking the expenses that his daughter incurs on his behalf is a great example of a practice that we talk about a lot establishing maintenance routines not to beat up ed too much <laughs> but if he'd made a habit of documenting each grocery receipt when he got it he wouldn't have ended up with his gordian knot of grocery record keeping and there's a lesson here for a lot of us <clears throat> it's easy to give in to the temptation to postpone small tasks in the busy activity of our lives but a decision like i'll look at today's mail tomorrow quickly becomes, I'll look at this week's mail on Saturday or next weekend, I'll look at all this mail that's been piling up and so on and so forth. To keep from falling into that trap, you wanna scan your daily habits and routines and look for little deferred decisions that put you at risk of creating big clutter after you've ignored them for a little bit. Darn right. Sorry, Ted. Sorry, Ed, we didn't mean to. No, Thank it's you, a, Tim. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> it's a, no, it's a really, it's a really valid point. It's a really valid point. It's very easy to postpone. Put things off. Yeah, just mm -hmm. sort of say, oh, well, this is going to take me. This is going to, so and, and it's not so much that it's going to, you know, okay, recording this receipt will take me two minutes. Sure, except that it's a two-minute interruption in other things that are weighing unloading on my groceries mind. or or the the project that's hanging over the work that i need to do the phone call i need to make mm -hmm. and so you sort of say i'll set it aside and do this when i have another one to do well it's really easy to just keep it's doing the same that. well and the thing yeah. is that every time you postpone the amount of time that you need to recover gets bigger yeah it just exactly. it becomes an ever longer amount of, of ever bigger time slot that you got to find to finish and catch up and then at some point like now you need four hours to catch up and nobody has that kind of time right right so you either have to postpone the phone call for the two minutes or you have to give up a sunday and spend four hours and 
you know, neither one of those options seems like a good one, but the two minutes is much easier and faster than the four hour Sunday that you surrender, right? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> there you go. Okay, let's get on to our main topic. And <laughs> this is inspired by the fact that I am moving again for the second <laughs> time in 13 months. And oh, we're, no. not gonna, we're not gonna talk about moving. We've talked a lot about moving. Yes. And uh, we're not going to talk about that. Instead, we're going to talk about the other thing we talk a lot about, which is paper. <laughs> um, I am, I find myself moving a bunch of boxes and bins of paper that I hadn't even touched since the last move. And I'm not going to go into exactly what they are. It's mostly business records that need to be boiled down and made paperless or thinned out. Yeah, thinned out. Um, but I thought this would be a good time. I, I went back to look at what we had done before, the topic of bigger buckets, a, a, a somewhat different approach to managing collections of papers than what people typically come up with on their own. And as Richard Bach said, we teach best what we most need to learn. So I thought <laughs> we could talk today about strategies for turning strategies for turning those boxes and bins of unsorted papers into much smaller and more sensible files. <laughs> what do you think? I think that's a great idea. And I'm sorry that we're throwing you under the bus so much today. It's okay. I feel bad about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So um, Ed's paper um, block is clearly, he's just like everybody else. Paper is not his strong suit. And in my line of work, I get more calls about paper than any other single category of clutter. Almost everybody who calls me struggles with paper at some level. I've met people who really like dealing with paper and they're people who are usually very detail oriented and perfectly happy to spend hours on end making paper super organized. It takes a lot of man hours and it takes a lot of focus to get all that paper and files and labeled. That's why secretaries and personal assistants and administrative assistants get paid to do that kind of paperwork all day. Most of us just don't have that kind of time. So I guess if you love doing it, then filing all the time is fun for you. But if you don't love to do it, and you're, but you're getting paid to do it, you can make yourself do it because you're getting paid. You're going to get money out of it. But if you're not one of those two people, what's the incentive to deal with your paperwork? For most of us, it's just a chore that you have to do to prevent disaster in your own life. There's always paper that we need to be able to put our hands on without too much trouble, just to let us manage our lives. So we need our insurance paperwork when we get help, so that we can get help when we wreck the car. We need the kids' immunization records when we want to enroll them in school. We need last year's tax return when we're trying to get a mortgage. We need the old family photos when it's time for a 60th wedding anniversary and we need to plan it and have cool old photos to go into the party. Some paper is stuff that we keep to make our lives run smoother when something happens. There's also paper in our life that we keep as memories and history and keepsakes. All of those photos that we inherited, all of that school paperwork, the playbills and tickets from all of the events that we've gone to, artwork from the grandkids, love letters from the old flame, and paper trail, history of our lives. This stuff doesn't really help our lives run smoother. Instead, it documents the past and our place in it. Some of us are more attached to this kind of paper than others, but everyone has some amount of keepsake paperwork. And Sammy has now left. <laughs> the last kind of paper we try to keep is information, like that receipt that you wanted, uh, the recipe, I'm sorry, receipt, the recipe that you wanna try, that article you want to read, the health or the cleaning tips that you save. There's lots of newspaper articles, magazine articles in this category, but you also have flyers and advertisements and class handouts and business cards that you're trying to save. For those of us that think we need to keep information handy, this pile of paper is ever growing one. For any of these categories of paper, we like to collect it, but we don't like to process it. We collect paper because we decide we need to keep it, but we never actually process it. <clears throat> and that means we end up with piles of paper that never get processed at all and can never be found later when you actually want it. 
So here's an experiment that I want you to try. If you think back over the last year, how many times can you recall going to the filing cabinet to dig something out? Not counting the times we go to the filing cabinet to add something, that's not what I'm asking about. Most of us probably only need to search for and retrieve a document fewer than a half a dozen times a year. If you're running a business from home or your situation involves an unusual amount of paperwork, this number might actually be higher. But for all of us, the complexity and the time we dedicate to the system on the front end, the sorting and the filing, it should be in reasonable proportion to how often we're going to need to access and retrieve the files later. So the short version of that is, you don't need to recreate the Library of Congress if you're only going to your filing cabinet twice a year to excavate a warranty or the receipt for a big purchase. So part of the problem is the processing we think we need to do up front is just too detailed. A file folder for each piece of paper doesn't help. Then you just have random paper chaos with file folders in between. A perfect example of this that I have saved now for a decade is from a client who saved me a file that her mother had created. This file was labeled Cardboard 2010, and it had one piece of cardboard <laughs> in the file folder. I and, love that story. Right? And that's like the perfect example of, I don't know what to do with this piece of cardboard. I need to save it. I'm going to put a file folder around it, and that makes it be organized. And no, it didn't. Of course it didn't. But that was, that's an example of what we do. We think capturing that one piece of paper with a file folder around it makes it organized. And like, no, that's not really it. We do the, exactly the same thing with each article that we try to save. For example, say you found an art, article about barbecuing that you want to save because it had great tips in it. So our knee-jerk reaction is to grab the file folder, put the barbecue article in it, and shove it in there and label it barbecue article. Later, when you find 14 more articles about barbecuing in various places, in various piles, each of them ends up in another file folder labeled barbecue beef tips, barbecue grills, barbecue tricks. Now you have 15 different files, all with one article in it, jammed into various filing cabinets. Can you really put your hands on the right barbecue article when you want to? Maybe, maybe not, depending on how careful you've been putting the files up. Since the premise here is we don't process the paper at all, I'm going to assume that you can't find it. <clears throat> so you're organized because the articles are in a folder, but there are so many folders you can't find the right one when you want it. And it's taken 15 times as long to put the papers away because you fold 15 different files and made 15 labels. So here's my idea. Why not make one file folder and one label with the bigger category of barbecue articles or barbecue reference or barbecue info, then put all 15 articles in one folder. When you want a specific article, you can search through those 15 articles in one place until you find the right one. This cuts your organizing time down because you're putting things in less buckets. You're aiming for bigger categories and that cuts down the work now and postpones the fine tooth organizing, the fine sorting that you're going to do until you actually need something instead of doing it all up front. So don't organize things you're not sure you need to see again. Collect them in big buckets and do some fine organizing later when the need arises. And do you understand the difference here? If you want to find article XYZ about barbecuing, you can pull out that folder and you know it's somewhere in the folder, you don't know exactly where, but then you're flipping 15 articles about barbecue instead of trying to find the one file folder with the one article that you file by the title in alphabetical order in five file drawers and you're trying to find that one little skinny file folder. Flipping and fine sorting through 15 articles is a much, um, it's postponing the fine sorting until you need the article and it's a much easier flip then where in this sea of files is that one article that I wanted to get? So let me give you some examples. We all pay electric, gas, cable, internet, water, phone, security. These are often not deductible expenses. So for most of us, those bills aren't worth keeping long-term because they're gonna support a tax deduction. So instead of having separate files for the cell company and the cable company, the electric company, the gas company, why not put them all in a file labeled utilities? It's a big bucket. You can put five or six bills each month in one folder. And if there's ever a problem, you just flip the contents of the file to get to the vendor and the bill that you want. 
after a few months or after you pay bills each month, you can purge paper that's in that file that's old to keep it from getting too full. And its size will help prompt you to do the purging too, because that folder will over the course of the year will get kind of fat. And it'll make sense that at some point when it gets too hard to stuff paper in it, it's taking too much space, it's too much to look at. You can go and pull a few months of the older stuff and throw those out now because you've got newer stuff at the front. As a rule of thumb, if you label a folder and only one piece of paper qualifies to go in that folder, then you're not making a big enough category. The goal is a broad enough topic that several things fall under the heading and go in the same folder. And if you've made a folder that starts to get too big for you because you're at the, the bucket is so big that you're putting a whole bunch in, then you can uh, sort later and you can sort that stuff into a couple of themes. Maybe you realize that now this folder that's, you know, two inches thick really has some subcategories in it and you can break it down to two or three folders instead of just the one. But start with the biggest bucket you can think of and see how it goes. If you find that it's four inches thick after two months, you probably need to subset it a little bit, <laughs> but you can use the size as a trigger for further action. Another example would be medical bills. People typically create a folder for each doctor, each hospital, each lab, each pharmacy, and why not have a folder for all the paper related to one big procedure instead? Say you're in the hospital for a surgery for a few days. So for those few days, you're going to get bills from all these doctors and the hospital and the labs and the pharmacy, and it's all going to be about this surgery. You'll get all kinds of results and take notes while you're talking to the doctors. All of it can be in one folder called the wrist surgery from 2019. And then everything related to that surgery can be in one bucket. A few months after the procedure, and after all the follow-up and your rehab is done and they declare your wrist repaired and <laughs> you're all finished, then you can pull the actual medical bills out of the folder and put them in the tax file if you're going to actually be able to deduct medical expenses. And then you're left with the results of the uh, tests and the scans and the labs and the notes that you took and anything that you wanna keep long-term. And that one folder holds everything related to that one event. Well, you don't, go ahead. I was going to say, and generally speaking, if the tax year on which you can deduct it has, has come and gone and you're not suing anybody. Right. Because it didn't go well. You don't need to keep any of it. You may no, keep, you may keep the piece, pieces that you will find interesting to you, but, but you are not legally required and you will not l be likely to find another use for any of that stuff ever again, because if you have to have a follow-up, your new doctor will request your medical records from your old doctor. You know? And then they'll just start doing all the tests all over again because they want fresh data. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so um, I think some people keep it because they want to be able to, if you have a lot going on, then you end up having to tell the doc, they want to know what all, what's all the surgeries you've had. What's all the, you know, they want the list of procedures. And I think you can get to the point where if it's 2021 and your wrist is fine, then the 2019 wrist surgery folder with a hundred pieces of paper in it can be purged. And you can go to a spreadsheet that is a list of your procedures and write, I had wrist surgery in 2019 and it was this doctor in this hospital. You know, these, this was the actual date that it had, took place. And, you know, you can sort of keep a little bit of historical data to be able to share with other doctors in the future and that'll be enough. Like you don't need to keep this whole file folder to remind you had wrist surgery. You just right. need to have the wrist surgery on a list somewhere. Right. <laughs> so, just, it could be a single line item on yeah, your medical yeah, yeah. history. On a spreadsheet, right? Yeah. If you don't have big medical issues, then you're going to the doctor because you have the flu and you're getting an annual checkup and you're getting your allergy shots and a mammogram. These are regular medical things and can be broken into big buckets right away. Medical bills go into the tax file if you're deducting them medical results, doctor's notes, lab results can go into a permanent medical results file, um, medical reports, whatever you want to call it. It serves as a medical miscellaneous file for stuff that isn't major enough to have its own folder. Like I had a hysterectomy and there was all this stuff around that, but I went one afternoon because I had the flu 
and they gave me a shot and three days later I was better is not, doesn't need a medical, it doesn't need its own folder. So you can have a miscellaneous bucket for all that kind of stuff. Think about your taxes for a minute. How many of you collect a whole bunch of paper for taxes and make a bunch of folders for each kind of paper? You know, you're going to have to add it all up for the accountant at the end. So why not make the bucket be taxes 2019 or 2021 and just put anything related to taxes in there? Then when tax time rolls around, you can pull that bucket out. You can do that one folder and then you can start doing the fine sorting that's necessary for you to come up with the numbers to give the accountant. But as you go through the year of 2021, you can be adding things in without any additional sorting into taxes 2021. And it all will be in the right place when you're ready to do the secondary work of now I have to add these things into categories and give the accountant, you know, subtotals based on here's depreciation and here's driving and here's whatever fill in the blank, right? So donations. <laughs> I'm saying that creating that bigger bucket and postponing the more fine sorting work to later makes processing the paper up front easier. And then you don't do any fine sorting work until you have to. And everybody has to do some fine sorting work for taxes. You can just plan on, here's the bucket and I'm going to pull it out in you know the early part of 2022 and start processing it. But in the meantime, in 2021, you can just run over, shove a paper. Here's a donation receipt. I go shove it in the 2021 tax folder and I'm done and out. And that saves you creating a whole bunch of folders on the front end that are not going to change the work you have to do on the back end. Gail, let's take a minute for a question from Peggy. Peggy, go, okay. ahead, go ahead and un, um, unmute yourself. If you okay. Okay. Um, this is a little unusual, but uh, my son had childhood cancer when he was 10, and I kept every medical record that he had ever had from that, and I had a whole filing cabinet full. Right. And so back a couple of months ago, I was downsizing to move, and I got rid of all of it, every bit of it, every oh, bit. Goodness. Okay. Two weeks later, he calls me and says, Mom, do you have any proof that I have lymphoma? Because I want to get my COVID shot early because he's young. And I, and I need that. I need that, some kind of <laughs> diagnosis thing. And I'm like, I kept that for 16 years. Oh, 16 no. <laughs> years. And now it's gone. So, but I mean, it turned out he didn't need it anyway. But, um, yeah. and the hospital didn't have it anymore either. Yeah, well, so the digital records are probably better than they used to be, but, you know, the farther back you go, the less likely that those records have been made part yeah. of a digital record. And the truth is, if you had asked, if you had consulted with me as if I had gone to your house to help you with this project, I would have said, like I do in other situations, this is a top, like this was a big event. And it incorporated a lot of um, pay, like a whole filing cabinet. Well, clearly you don't need the whole filing cabinet, but you might need the cream of the crop. You, not, yeah. you might need a little historical record about here. This is the final report after they got or all done. The they yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but you I mean, could have I kept just... a file folder's worth of stuff related to it and gotten rid of 99.5% of the rest, yeah. right? Yeah. And so in your enthusiasm, this happens a lot. You're sort of like, okay, I'm done. Woo! I'm throwing it all out. <laughs> yes. Yes. That enthusiasm, uh, you know, sometimes trips us up a little bit, but I totally well, get it. And the truth is you ultimately, in order to answer his question, you probably needed one piece of paper yeah. out of all of that file cabinet. Right. Right. And yeah. so the only thing that you could have done differently is take some notes about it, about the doctor or the you know, you probably could have gotten to the doctor's private records and had them provide something for him, even if the hospital didn't have records. Of no, the anymore. doctor is now retired. Well, see, true. there you go. <laughs> right. Um, so in the end, he was OK. Yeah, he got and, it. You know, it just made you feel like, oh, my gosh, I failed as a mother, but you didn't. <laughs> you didn't. I'm like, I kept him for 16 years. And then also <laughs> I had called you back when I was going through all this, doing all this stuff about the 
You may remember me asking you about the Christmas music boxes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So what I did was I chose about five of them that I wanted to keep. And then I texted both of my kids. I sent them pictures and I said, okay, if you want any of these, tell me which ones you want. And my son picked like two. And then my oh. daughter's like, I want the rest of them. And I said, really? Because I didn't think she would. And so come to find out that she's pregnant and it was just very emotional for her. She goes, you can't throw out dad's music boxes that he gave you. No, no, no. Oh yeah. Pregnancy <laughs> hormones, right? Them, and she's like, well, I'll probably get rid of some of them too, but yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Just, so it, it's a, it's a good, like she's a young woman and she's newly pregnant as a mother and she's seeing the results of, you know, here, okay, now when I'm 50 or 60, I'm going to have all this stuff I need to get rid of. So, <laughs> she can get rid of it, right? Right. And I the mean, truth I'm is you it. kept five and your son kept two. So that's seven of them out of the list. Mm -hmm. She kept the rest, but now she's, you know, she's got to go back and pick her favorites and let some of them go. And so yeah. that's okay. If she wanted to make her pass over it to deal with her own emotional response to the keepsakes, that's fine. And I want to say congratulations to you for picking your five favorites and making the, the collection, the size that you can manage. Yeah. So that's excellent. And Thank if you. she, and you know, your son got to ever, both of the kids got to have their a uh, chance to touch the memories and keep what they wanted, which was lovely. And mm -hmm. so now if, you know, if she wants to make that process longer for herself in order to, process the emotions about it that's okay and but you know good on you it is now you own five and right. yay <laughs> good you. job and next time when you throw out the whole file cabinet keep a page or two <laughs> okay <laughs> well you've inspired me anyway so thank you. oh you're so welcome thanks for reporting back i'm glad to hear the end of that tale well, the, uh, the story of the music boxes moves us to keepsakes. Yes. Keepsakes is a big bucket, right? So don't worry about separating cards from photos, letters from cards. Everything that's a keepsake can go in a keepsake box. You might have a box for larger items because there might be some 3D things like an old corsage or a dress or a cup. And then one keepsake box that's for true paper like photos and cards. I think that we all have some keepsakes and we all need to keep them in a bucket. And the temptation is to put them in files in with all of our regular paperwork and those keepsakes are just going to get in the way. So you need to separate keepsakes. The only reason you're keeping them is for memory purposes. It's not about managing your life. It's just about being able to walk down memory lane. So separate all those keepsakes into another bucket into and, and make it actually be a separate box and not part of your regular household filing system. Um, in a chat from a previous episode, a participant in Zoom named Bonnie said, I got rid of a five drawer filing cabinet a year ago. I put all the files in tubs and now I'm going through and purging them. I'm realizing that what I needed or thought I needed 10 or 15 years ago is a lot different from today. So Bonnie went on to share a simpler system for saving paper that she's devised for herself that's very similar to our bigger buckets approach. Um, in the same chat, Petra shared, my mother-in-law kept each and every bill in separate paper protectors. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was a fun afternoon getting rid of all that separating paper and plastic. Ugh, I can imagine. So I'm sure that your uh, mother-in-law felt like putting all of those bills in sleep protectors and probably in binders of some kind or folders um, that gave her a sense of control. And yeah, she was probably of the age when paper was king and there was nothing else. And her and she never really adapted her system to the new uh, to the new life, right? So <laughs> sorry you had to do that job. I'm sure it was super entertaining, but it did teach you the lesson that you did not want to be doing that yourself, right? Like that was a good thing to get out of it. So I think, uh, we, um, go ahead. What Bonnie said really <clears throat> resonates. I'm going to quote the key bit. Okay. I'm realizing that what I needed or thought I needed 10 to 15 years ago is a lot different from today. And I want to try, you know, as I dig through the piles of paper. Yeah, your buckets from your business records. Bins that I've moved, I, I, 
I want to have that sort of echoing in the back of my head. Just because I thought I needed something three years or 10 years ago when it went into the bin does not mean I am required to keep it. Well, and you have to know that some of the things go in the bin and you've erred on the side of caution because you're saying to yourself, I might need that. And therefore you throw it in the bucket, which is really, I don't want to be brutally honest with myself right in this moment because I'm tired or because this is my fourth hour of sorting paper or whatever the reason that it ends up in the bucket. It may not have been a good reason. And so when you go back through it, you're going to find yourself going, why did I stick this in here to keep? What was I thinking? In a moment of weakness and tiredness and whatever you thought, I'll save it just in case. And you threw it in the bucket. And now you get to take it out and throw it out. So Marcy said, it never fails that as soon as I finally get rid of something, I end up needing it. <laughs> I read something on that being some mental energy thing. And, and she added, as far as papers go, it is usually something that I end up needing to get some money back that I got rid of after years, right before some refund offer comes up, like an old long distance bill years ago that were being refunded. I have, I have noticed a similar phenomenon that you get one of those class action lawsuit notifications and it says, <laughs> and all you have to do to get your 23 cents, your share of the class action settlement yeah. is provide documentation that you are part of the, of the class of the class. And uh, yeah, really? You're going to get $10 and 39 cents. Is it really worth counting all that effort? on? Yeah. And you're probably not even getting cash. You're getting right. a $10 and 39 cent coupon toward something that the company that's making the settlement could provide you. Right. <laughs> that you don't really want anyway. <laughs> that's the biggest thing to remember. Well, uh, I, I usually. <sighs> I mean, and this may not work for everyone, but I, when I usually in that situation, I just tell myself my time is worth more than this. Mm -hmm. Even if I have on the off chance that I have the piece of paper I need, it's going to take me a hundred dollars worth of my time to dig it up and get $10 worth of uh, money back. Yeah. And, you know, for some people, maybe it's worth the effort, uh, but everybody has to process it that differently. Like if I have to spend four hours to get this $10, is it worth it? It, Trying to find the documentation. Some things are not worth the effort is what we can say. (laughs) Some things are just not worth the exercise of going and chasing it down. And, and some are, so you get to decide at what threshold you're willing to, how much you're willing to suffer to, to solve that problem. And you can't save all the paper against the possibility that something like that is going to turn back around. I don't know how to filter that for you. I don't know how to make that thinner. I, well, I think the you, filter with that in mind. You hold on to the things where there's a larger possibility of return of return. You know, the big ticket items. Yeah. If you held on to the documentation for every dollar that you ever spent, it would be enormous but yeah if you know with some threshold you know receipts for anything that you spent more than a hundred dollars on or maybe your threshold is fifty dollars mm-hmm. because those are going to be and, the only ones that are worth like if there's if there's a refund if there's a class action settlement if there's a some sort you know some sort of thing where you can get your taxes you know get taxes back or something right it's it's only going to be worth the trouble on larger items right and if you spend eight hundred dollars on a dress it doesn't matter that you spend eight hundred dollars on the dress it's not likely to be able to turn into something right it's more that you spent eight hundred dollars on a refrigerator (laughs) right something like that so you can even even with that parameter of over a dollar threshold you can still filter for things that you bought that is in no way going to be you know i did a car repair is one thing but i bought new sheets is a different thing right i'm thinking more along the lines of the things uh, you know electronics appliances the things where there could conceivably be a recall you know yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm with you. Okay. 
we have tons and tons of comments, but I want you to, uh, I want to make sure you have time to get through everything that's prepared. So, oh, okay. So we have one more. Then, so we yeah. have one, we want to keep this concept of bigger buckets in mind and let's talk about an idea for an exercise. If you have a big backlog of paper that needs attention before you start labeling file folders, try this exercise, take a representative sample, say two inch thick stack that you've grabbed from several places in a larger stack that you've been working on. And on your kitchen or dining table, sort this stack of paper into files that you think you'll need. So don't create the files, just create some piles first. If you need to remind yourself what's in each stack, then make some quick post-it note labels to stick on the little piles to help you identify. And without thinking about it too hard, put each item into an existing stack or start a new stack if it seems as if you're gonna need one. Once you've sorted your representative sample, the original two inches that you grabbed, evaluate your stacks. How many categories only have one or two pieces of paper in them? Which categories could you, if you have one or two pieces of paper in a couple of stacks, could you combine some of those stacks into another bigger bucket? The point of this exercise is to keep you from making 50 file folders if 10 will solve the problem. Remember, if one file folder gets too fat, it's easy to go in and split it into two or three folders later, but an overly complex system of filing will slow down your filing process and make document retrieval a nightmare later. No one who takes one piece of paper and puts it in one file folder with a label and then files all of those file folders alphabetically can ever find the piece of paper that they want because one day they label the barbecue article barbecue and they file it in A. And then the next one they label grilling barbecue and they file it in G. And they can't remember where in the alphabet of files they filed that article. And so it is going to be much easier if you can consolidate all of the barbecue articles together and then pull out one folder and go flipping for the one that you want. You can get, you can zero in with less work later. And so I know that your knee-jerk response <laughs> is to make one file folder with one for each piece of paper. And I want you to fight that impulse and try to find a bigger bucket, make a bigger category out of it and see if you can make that happen and live with those categories and see if they work. Then the six times a year when you actually have to retrieve a piece of paper, you're going to pull out one of those 10 buckets, 15 buckets of files and you're going to flip through that paper looking for it. And maybe it takes you 15 minutes to find the right one, 10 minutes, big deal, right? That's that 10 minutes that you spend to find the article on the back end is a lot less time than the four and a half hours. It'll take you to make all these in their own files instead of in big buckets of 10. What we're saying here is experiment, grab a representative sample of your paper, sort it into some piles um, of large potential big bucket categories and see how you do and see whether some big buckets suggest themselves and whether all of the individual pile papers, papers that you make piles by themselves with only one or two things in it, see if you can come up with a bigger category to merge some of those things together. And um, there is always the miscellaneous bucket. You can have big buckets, utilities, taxes, house, and then you can have a miscellaneous bucket <laughs> that has other things that don't have um, a big collection of things. Ultimately, you may end up with 20 pieces of paper of completely unrelated things in miscellaneous, but you can flip 20 pieces of paper fast enough. Um, if the miscellaneous file gets to be 50 pieces of paper, then you probably need to break it down into something else. But that's an example, like miscellaneous can be a bucket that's big enough for all the little tiny random one-offs that don't make that don't fit into another larger category. Okay, that is the experiment I want you to try, and when you're getting ready to do your tackle your big filing project and see if it helps you create some bigger buckets to work with. And once you decide on the bigger buckets, then you can create file folders for those bigger buckets and start filing things into your bigger buckets and see how it goes. Okay. I want to circle back because I um, I lost a comment <laughs> that, I, that I was sort of we were in the middle of talking about, and I have to apologize to Marcy because she um, 
the thing she had gotten rid of was documentation that could have supported getting a refund on taxes ah. and and she ended up getting forty dollars and it it might have been hundreds ah well yeah you know taxes it, right it's hard to anticipate that and Go well, it's one of the frustrating things about like when it's the phone you know when it's your when it's your cell phone company or something like that and you know they sort of sometimes the class action things put you put the onus on you to document what you do mm -hmm. which is really frustrating but I, I think still for myself I'd rather not carry around the not keep have to keep all of that paper right well and the the tax thing too is our taxes from year to year don't our situation in our taxes from year to year don't usually vary widely and they don't they're not constantly very different taxes on uh the long distance bill not mm. income tax mm. okay okay yeah all right so all right that was a unique situation yes i'm yeah. sorry that you lost a, money yeah that's a bummer i um you know in the process of the move we've gone from this is tangentially related i promise we've gone <laughs> from a great big apartment to a somewhat smaller house and i find myself thinking about a really cute little table that I gave away to bring a move years and years and years ago. And I just have to, and I think, oh, if only I had that table. Well, I have to <laughs> remind myself, yeah, but I would have had to find a place for it for the all the interim years between for the then 10 and years now. since I gave it away. Marcy has her <laughs> hand up, so I'd like to give her a chance. And Tammy also has her hand, hand up, and I promise we will get back to you, Tammy. Um, but Marcy, go ahead. Hi, I'll make it quick because I know you want to go back to things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just, I, now what I do is I'll scan anything or take pictures of receipts that I think, like things, utilities, things like that, that may have something that I may need for tax purposes or a refund or something like that. And since it usually seems to be things that are associated with government taxes, those are usually, you know, the things that's that the kind of stuff you take now. pictures of. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was an excise tax and you were paying an excise tax on long distance. And we spoke for hours and hours before the unlimited came through, uh, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, it was, it was a lot of money. And I was just like, whatever, Murphy's law, that guy's going to be in trouble when we all get up and meet him. That's all. <laughs> 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 Well, and it, it's good that you've adapted to um, how you sort of help yourself feel more comfortable about that going forward is that you're taking pictures or scanning, um, you're creating a digital version of the records that you can keep up with. Um, and that's, you know, that's a good adaptation. Yep. Thank you. Carry Thank on. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Tammy, you've had your hand up a while. If you are, if you will unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. You can. Thanks, Ed. Hi, Gail. Yes, Hi, I may have, Hi, I may have asked this before. Um, I have uh, PTSD and OCD and anxiety and all kinds of things. So is there a way I can, um, I don't know, tame those while I'm going through my papers? And, you know, I liked what you said about um, just like I relate to the cardboard folder. I've done things like that, um, but right. you know, something I can um, hmm, use for my mental, um, the, the things I'm dealing with in my brain. I'm not sure um, that yeah. I am the best person to tell you, uh, but the if you're basically saying that dealing with paper triggers PTSD, OCD, anxiety, then you need to do the things that normally are soothing to you in other situations and apply them in the paper. So I can imagine that looking at all the paper at once is distressing and you might try the idea of taking a small sample and going somewhere else with it and working with it and then going back to the paper and getting another little batch and coming and working with it so that you're not looking at all the paper while you're trying to work on a small portion of it. Um, I would also try working in smaller increments like you're not a good candidate for sitting down for four hours on a Sunday and trying to work on paper for four hours straight. Like that would be too much. So maybe you want to find the amount of time that you can comfortably work on paper without sort of sliding off into 
too much anxiety or feeling um, triggering PTSD, maybe that's half an hour or 45 minutes before you have to call it a day. And so you tackle it in much smaller bites so that it's a little bit easier for you to absorb. Five minutes might be all I can do right now. And well, can- that's okay. So if you if all of you got is five minutes, then I would just grab a little handful of paper and uh, get a box that says keep on it and just do the initial pass of paperwork five minutes at a time where you decide it's staying or you decide it can go. So that all you're really trying to do in that five minutes is make a keep toss decision and it keep it, it goes in the keep box. Don't try to organize what's in the keep box, just put it in the keep box. And if it can go, then you can recycle it, shred it, throw it out, whatever makes you comfortable. And you do that for five minutes worth of paper, which might be 10 pieces. And then you move on to something else. And that you just circle back for those five minutes. Maybe you do five minutes every hour, or maybe you do five minutes twice a day or work it into your daily work. I know you're working on other things in your house too. And so if paper is harder, then do it in smaller bites and do it frequently a few times over the day as much as you feel like you can manage. Right. Right. Yeah. I have, it'll make the process slower for you, but if that's what's necessary for you to cope and to move forward, then every effort counts, all things count. Right. And so if you're making an incremental movement forward, that's really small, that's better than zero. Right. So everything counts. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's what I have to do. I have all these buckets and nothing makes sense. And I have a cabinet, but it's just all like, receipts with files and things I need right now and it's just all a big <laughs> so right. that's what my brain is my brain's all scrambly so all right. yeah well so then your buckets your buckets are easy one keep one and then toss <laughs> and so you only have to make a decision between yes or no and then oh. you get and that's going to end up with it's going to help you get rid of some of the volume and you'll be left with a bucket of unsorted stuff, but that can be another stage that you do later. Right now, you're just trying to get through the paper and it's already scrambleized anyway. So you might as well have a scrambleized bucket of vetted choices that you've made of things to keep and see if you can't let some of that scrambled paper uh, be ready to go out the door. We need to wrap up so head um, to the tittle okay yes and tammy stick around and we'll talk some more and i also um linda and glenn and deborah all have hands up and we'll come back to you after we stop the 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 official recording okay meanwhile back to gail (laughs) for it's for the weekly tittle right yeah we need to give our well let me also say before we uh get to that i want to remind anyone who's watching or listening that we have a youtube channel with 150 videos on a wide variety of topics go to cfhou.com slash youtube and we hope you'll subscribe to our channel we're getting close to 17,000 subscribers and click on the bell icon next to the subscribe button to get notifications when we post new content Okay, let's get to this week's tittle. Okay, so we've been beating on paper a lot today. So we thought we'd create a non-paper tittle today just to give you a little relief. And this is where, um, who is the person that that jumped the gun on the tittle? We thought the weather is lovely outside here. Connie. Connie. And so we're all happy for the arrival of spring. So why not step out onto your outdoor patio, your outdoor area where you might be Uh, contemplating uh, you're going to start barbecuing again or you're going to do outdoor entertaining or you're going to sit out in the morning with your coffee and enjoy the lovely weather and so maybe it's time to go out to that outdoor area and do a little reconnaissance clean up start you know getting rid of the leaves and refreshing the cushions and cleaning this the chairs that have been snowed on all winter long or been out there in the dirt and the storms and you know make it pretty for yourself again so that you can start your spring routine of sitting outside with yourself or your friends. Spring and outdoors is a good uh, socially distanced way to interact with people again. And so it's time to go out there and clean up and set up and get yourself someplace really cool to go enjoy the new weather. 
Okay, excellent. That's our tittle. <laughs> we'll be back. We will be back next week, Tuesday, April 6, 2021, at noon US Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. Yep. If you're watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from our audience. Please keep those comments and questions and topic suggestions coming in YouTube, on Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairyhouston.com where we have a new and improved contact form. Oh, very, that's right. You just launched the new just contact form. Very exciting to, you know, web designer nerds like myself <laughs> and almost no one else. <laughs> and those of us who have to deal with the form appreciate you. It's so true. Uh, thank right. you guys for joining us. We really appreciate that you came and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.